Hi, Brent. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tasha. Yeah, glad to be here. So there's a lot of stuff I feel like we could talk about that I'm interested to learn about. Of course, you're doing Refract, and I'm curious about that. And I'm curious about kind of the relationship with spirituality that would even inspire you to do Refract in the first place, like therapy work and Buddhism and Christianity and all of that. Um, also, we have our shared interest in music and EDM, and we can talk about that. But um, yeah, I'm just thinking about it. Like often for me with these conversations, there's something specific that I want to learn or something I'm interested in. But also even beyond that, it's like the person that I get to talk to is just incredible. And like, who is this person? And to me, every every person in the whole world even is just almost like a piece of art that God made or something like that. And it's like, oh, I really want to witness this person as they are. And this podcast feels like a chance to do that and to really see someone and get to know who they are. And that's why I like to start out with the life story question to just be like, who is this person? Where are they coming from? What are they about? What's happened to them in their life? Almost like, I, I mean, you know, you know me, I believe in reincarnation and it's almost like the reincarnation level equivalent of like, how's your day going? Like what's happening to you today, <laughs> except on the life scale, like what's happened so far, <laughs> catch us up on this episode. <laughs> like, how do you see it? What do you see as happening in your life? Mm. So um, yeah, I would love to start with that question and just ask you about your life and what's happened so far and how you understand the things that have happened to you. And you can answer that in any way that you like at whatever length you'd like. I'd love to hear about it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, for for a little bit, and yeah, really excited to talk with you, especially in this format. Um, mm. I I think we've talked privately about this, but a lot of the conversations that you've recorded here have really touched me, mm. and they've been amazing. And uh, yeah, I, I think that attitude um, of seeing people as this complete story, this special thing, this unique spark, is something uh, you know I put on my my toshing goggles as it were um and uh yeah see everyone as guan yin if we want to go down that path and uh yeah, it's just a really special thing so mm -hmm. thanks for thanks for creating this space mm -hmm. thanks brent so uh life story i felt some weird feelings prepping for this part <laughs> uh yeah, I think like sharing details, I'll just share details and uh, share share how I got here and maybe it resonates, maybe, maybe not. But um, yeah, I think if we zoom out, my life's kind of gone through like different, uh, different phases. Like we had the curiosity time of growing up. We had the, uh, like the mission time, the impact time after that, um, you know, and then we'll call it like sabbatical slash eh time um so yeah so uh i grew up in what has to be described as a as a super loving household like my mom and dad were not perfect but they were very self-aware and super caring like um and yeah that in in that backdrop i like my most of my excitement growing up was I, I either wanted to be a pastor or an astrophysicist. I, I don't know where that second one came in. I, I was trying to trace it back. I don't know, but pastor or astrophysicist, it was going to be, I don't think I could even say the word astrophysicist. So I would um, walk around as a 10 year old telling everyone that I just really want to get into cosmetology, um, which I was... <laughs> people would laugh and say oh wow and then I later found out that I actually wanted to get into cosmology um I didn't want to get into makeup I wanted to get into the origins of the universe <laughs> and, and yeah uh some of my best memories like I, I when I think about it, my childhood think about growing up like it's just all books man like flipping pages um just following wherever the curiosity led um but yeah, there were there were really like two two threads that emerged, especially as I got into college, like kind of left left my home, left this like, you know, by all means incredibly nourishing place. And you know, there was the God thread of I 
love God. I love Jesus. I, I love what this means for me. I love what this means for the world. And I want to follow that, that pastor calling. But then also this building thing that I found out I could just put my fingers on this little 87 key thing and like, you know, worlds emerge, little products. And um, yeah, that intoxication uh, hit me pretty, pretty quick, like around 18 of just like, I, I just want to build things, man. <laughs> like, whether it be NaNoWriMo, like the, writing a uh, writing a novel or building products, uh, it just, it was like fucking amazing. And so um, kind of in that like two threads, uh, I don't want to flicker between the two of them too much, but like, uh, yeah, my second year of college, I, I started a company that was doing private school finance. And uh, I I just love the experience of building something that people are using, that they're paying. Like I, I started it with one of my best friends and we had just like a ton of fun doing that. Um, and yeah, it was really, it was like a period of finding the others that also just love building, like finding the other founders, finding those other people that weren't sleeping um, <laughs> because they just wanted to just wanted to create something. And yeah, that was, um, you know, I read a lot of books and did not make a lot of friends <laughs> if, if we look back at uh, before that time. And it was just an amazing experience. Um, and I really felt this like re rehashing of this experience when I found Teapot and found Twitter, but like, not being understood in a specific way, understanding yourself in a specific way. And then suddenly like all these people are around that want to support you and want to like jam on it. And man, it was fun. Um, yeah. And then I guess parallel to that, there was like Brent that just really loved to spend his time praying and reading theology books and like making sense of the universe and in, in whatever way uh, he could. And I I have a lot of like love for that past brand. I think it's very easy to like look at where it I you know when I when I left the faith when I kind of went out and it's easy to look back and see oh you know that was just like fitting this neurosis or this like you know I just had this unmet need that God was like kind of filling that hole but like no it kind of it rules like uh having a direct relationship with God and yeah, just the warmth and presence that that brought to everyday life was really beautiful. Um, and then I went off and did like that rationalist thing of like totally radicalizing myself. So I'm reading all of this, like uh, all this theology, trying to find like, wow, clearly there's something here. Like, I love talking to God. There's something here. But like this part of the Bible doesn't quite make sense or this 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 doesn't quite fit in like how do we make okay well let's look at this system now that system doesn't work and kind of like rotated through all these different like theological frameworks until i found uh calvinism which um ayla had this tweet i think of like 20 likes back three years ago of like calvinism is the autists christianity and like <laughs> it's it's so true man <laughs> like man it hits so good for that reason of like what if we just found as much internal con consistency and like trusted the bible as much as we possibly could and but unfortunately like you follow that and it means like there's no good outside of god um uh, like some other like really like god is control of everything and determines everything um and yeah it kind of left was left with this like tougher view of the universe. Um, but, but as I, as I kept going deeper and deeper, I really just believed like, uh, there's this, you know, kind of binary thing that existed of you either love God, accept Jesus and go to heaven or you don't and you go to hell. And uh, yeah, QC had this uh, long thread recently about like just fucked up things happen when you attach an infinite value, like infinite negative to your value function. And like this idea of like, if I don't talk to people over these 90 years or however I have, however I have in my, in my life, if I don't do that, um, then people are going to go to hell. And so it makes sense to drop everything, like deny everything and, you know, follow Christ by teaching people about that and yeah i wouldn't say i got into like anything too fucked up but it did lead me um yeah kind of down the path of 
Mm. Yeah, I don't I don't like the the word fucked up all actually at all associated with this, but um Yeah, uh I'm gonna take a sec. Yeah, it's weird to talk about this this narrative. Like it's it's very much a part of me and also um feels like it happened so long ago now. <laughs> and yeah. But yeah, I uh I ended up moving to the Middle East, like learning Arabic, going and and pretty much saying, like, great, if this is the way, like if this is the cosmic math, then let's spend, you know, every every waking moment telling people about Jesus, find the people that know about him the least and and go do that. And, um, yeah, I guess after a summer, I realized, uh, that wasn't it for me. Like I, I clearly felt I either was supposed to be a missionary slash pastor or a business dude and just, just realized like, okay, that doesn't really suit me. So I'll just go and earn as much money as I possibly can just get super mega rich and then donate it all to other people to be missionaries. Um, and yeah, kind of in that frame, I uh, met a girl, uh, we got married right out of out of college. And yeah, like really beautiful, brilliant woman. Um, and we, yeah, I, I kind of found myself at age 22, like raising money for this company I'd started um, having this like, internal alignment of like, okay, great, we're gonna raise money, you know, kind of get the bag give it all to missions, have everyone know God, you know, success, um, you know, surrounded by like <laughs> a lot of people that, that I think, uh, yeah, I genuinely, genuinely loved and loved me. Um, and then, yeah, that fall, right after I graduated, right after I was married, um, someone really close to me, uh, attempted suicide in a, in a pretty dramatic way. And yeah, over, over a five hour search and rescue party, um, where they, you know, helicopters and cops and everything just looking for them. Um, I just remember spending that time like praying. And at first it started, um, asking God for support, but it just got angrier and angrier. And, uh, yeah, uh, there was this airing of grievances that I didn't know I had where uh, I, this cold universe where if nothing good happens outside of God, um, if God's, you know, determines everything and, and this awful thing would happen, then, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want that father in my life. Like I won't, you know, I, that wasn't, that wasn't what I believed. And, you know, we can, we can build up, all these, all these structures, David Chapman gave words to, to what I experienced like a couple of years later when I was reading his work, but we can build all these structures and belief system. But then eventually, if you commit to something hard enough, you're going to have a piece of disconfirming evidence that just doesn't sit with you. And uh, yeah, my whole belief system just like shattered. Um, it was really painful. There was, um, yeah, a lot of depression involved, um, a lot of numbness, um, but uh, yeah, um, I guess on the bright side, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I left, I was leaving my community, like all my friends were Christian and kind of figuring out what the, you know, what the hell happens next. And there's something really interesting that I've noticed about like evangelicals and like ex evangelicals, especially. And, uh, yeah, even some of my like more, uh, devout, like ex Islam friends, um, ex Muslim friends, uh, there's like this USB port that gets installed in your brain 
and like God plugs in and then you remove God out of that. And it's not like that USB port goes away, <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I found, yeah, especially in like the other people that I've met with similar backgrounds, like this just incredible capacity for mission, for, for belief, for like to pick something audacious and big and go for it. And um, yeah, for me, that looked like, climate tech i was just gonna you know I, I took all of this like let's save the world by telling them about jesus energy and just funnel it right into let's build the best machine learning algorithms and do all the all the right math all that and we're we're gonna like draw down this carbon and 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 survive as a species and yeah in a lot of ways like i'm i'm just fucking thankful for for that religious upbringing for for whatever god gave me uh that that did touch me so deeply because yeah it just i think it's a really that's a part i love about myself and uh yeah so i, I went just funneled all that energy into climate 60 80 hour weeks uh we were just like working 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 um absolutely loved building like you know yeah there was some neurotic like avoiding of feelings going on for sure the marriage wasn't going super well I didn't really like that my dog barked all the all the time but like I was having so much fun building worlds over here um and yeah it kind of did did that first business joined another um both were like early stage climate tech or like you know one was kind of machine learning and manufacturing the other was robotics um in a vertical farm and had like incredible amount of fun with both um and then my uh wife at the time sat me down and said hey brent like this this isn't working you know i'm i want your permission before we end it like i want your buy-in but uh you know this is over like this this marriage is over and there's yeah there's a funny thing when you like commit your life to someone you know you're saying like yeah whatever whatever goes on like you're going to be a constant like it's kind of like that faith system like whatever goes on you're going to um god is going to be in the picture and uh yeah, I think like that was my second existential opening or maybe my first like uh that you just you have that picture of what your life's going to look like and then it just gets like ripped out and uh yeah, in the wake I uh had a had a dear friend hand me um a jar of mushrooms for the first time and said go for it <laughs> and so you yeah. know I went for it. Um, learned a lot there. Uh, like, you know, my anxiety was totally driving so much of my productivity. And, you know, you remove that and <laughs> tough things happen. Um, there was like this just like rediscovery. I, I remember I just loved this reading and fiction and like all sorts of arts and music when I grew up. And, and then you take the mushrooms and they kind of like, you know, bring you out of that you know brent's view of the world is dominating into like we actually make contact with the world directly um a little bit and yeah so suddenly poetry was like the coolest fucking thing i had ever found uh, <laughs> and art was i could just stare at a piece of art and just like be moved and i had never i never had that experience since i was a kid um and yeah i guess the other fun thing that happened was uh you know this my first ever trip, I had this experience of like, afterward, like some amazing things happened. But then afterwards, I just had this like, tinnitus, but instead of just like a sharp ringing noise, it was just this voice that kept saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it, it went on for about a week, I was way less concerned than maybe I should have been like just a constant voice. But um, right around that time, I found your writings on meta and i had just experienced this like feeling of like oh this is what like t what it feels like to be loved internally and uh like from myself and this voice just giving me this incredible gift of like feeling self-love um and yeah i got really into the meditation the meta all that good stuff um it very you know realizing that anxiety was a productivity driver and dropping that meant i was 
utter shit at my job for for three months and uh yeah quit that went on a sabbatical uh did my whole eat pray love year and uh <laughs> and that led to uh to starting starting refract in kind of this uh this current era of um of building of solidity of uh of stability but yeah that's the uh that's the that's the life story so far incredible what a roller coaster it's been so far <laughs> um <clears throat> I'd love to ask you, you said a little bit about this, but can you say more about when you were in the thick of really believing in God and Christianity, what was that like for you almost phenomenologically? Like, how do you understand now what that was like for you? Mm. Yeah, I love the, ah, and it, if you want to be my friend, it's really easy. You just use the word phenomenology. <laughs> <laughs> so there's yeah this this sense of purpose and of like clicking is the thing i get when i put myself in back in that frame of like oh yeah okay this is like not a lot makes sense like <laughs> i was yeah not a lot makes sense but this does and um so there, there's like this belief system level, like reassurance of like, hey, don't worry, like things might be going wrong, but like, at least, at least like God loves you. And at least Jesus like died for you. Um, I think there was a lot more cognitive dissonance that I give myself credit for back then too, because it was like, you know, clearly this stuff, something, something's here, but just from like age 13 i think i really would have gone to um to seminary and become a pastor if this wasn't the case but like there was just there were certain claims certain like metaphysical claims that just weren't clicking and um yeah it's actually i, I feel a lot of sadness and compassion looking back because there was a, the the conclusion was just very naturally something's wrong with me if i'm doubting mm -hmm. like oh it's not there's nothing wrong with the belief mm -hmm. system like i'm just I'm just missing something. Um, mm. So yeah, but then, um, man, coming coming to Meta was so great because my favorite practice, like uh, back in the day, was just walking around on the street and just seeing people and just like wishing them well and like giving them little prayers and hoping that they find God or or whatever it looked like at that time. And like, I love that shit. Like it was <laughs> it was really great. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of what it looked like. Mm. How would you describe almost the relationship between meta and prayer or the kinds of techniques you're doing at the time? Like what was the overlap or relation between them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was this, um, I might botch the book name, but uh, Brother Lawrence um, Encounters with Silence, although I think that was Carl Rahner, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was Encounters with Silence, but this is, no, it wasn't practice in the presence that's the word uh practice practice of the presence of god um and it was this i think 14th century uh monastic that just resolved to talk to god all the time and do everything for the glory of god and yeah when he um when he was brushing the brooms uh he would be doing it for for the kingdom of god and uh when he uh you know, was cooking he'd, he'd be doing it for for god's glory and there's this I, I don't quite have the words for it but there's this tie of like when i do metta now it feels like a a prayer but it's not like to god for the person it's like a prayer to the person um and both like both feel causal in a way i i'm definitely in the camp of uh that wibbly wobbly like intention soupy thing that goes on when you put something out there's there's something there um and yeah uh but also just like it also being both being a prayer to yourself to like just that intention and uh that giving up a prayer that giving of metta to someone is such a uh purifying and beautiful expression of like of your soul i mean i i don't want to be like too overly cheesy or, or poetic with this but like you're giving yourself a gift in both cases so strongly um yeah i don't know if that makes sense 
It does. I love it. I'm, I'm, I was just nodding figures. So I was like, yes, this <laughs> contention yeah. soup causal effects. Like, uh, <laughs> this, I love this part about you hearing the phrase, I love you over and over again for a week or something like that. And, um, do you understand that as you telling yourself that or something else? Mm. I like holding things in mystery. Mm. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. Mm. Mm. What you, I love this joke you made about your eat, pray, love year and like, your friend handed you mushrooms and you went for it and you know you had these effects and then you did meta and you know i know you're doing uh different kinds of self-therapy techniques can you walk me through kind of what was your inner life like at that time like what were what techniques were you doing what were your inner experiences like what kinds of shifts happened yeah definitely uh, beautiful yeah definitely it was like an eat pray love year say like mm -hmm. there's uh there were like a few different things of um this phrase that I kept saying to myself of like, if I've sinned, it's by underliving. Mm. And so like, God damn it, I was going to party as a spiritual practice. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Mudita blast. Yes. <laughs> so that was, that was certainly part of it of like, yeah, we're, I, I can get very serious about building and, you know, we're going to build the monastery, but yeah, let's, let's, let's go live. Um, felt really important. Um, the yeah on the contemplative side metta was was a huge part um just cultivating and practicing love um turns out like it, it was just shocking to me how much love was just sitting under the surface just mm -hmm. waiting for like an excuse to come out and uh yeah maybe maybe that's like you know i'm a i'm a metta boy we've got the karuna boys and mm -hmm. you know others but uh you know i'm Meta definitely comes close to me, um, close for me. It's easy, it's easy to access, but, um, yeah, it's also, I just, I think that that's not, that's not unique to me. I think like there are a lot of people with the experience of like, once you clear out just a little bit of the cruft, there's like this just super unconditional loving substrate under a lot of people. Um, you know, maybe IFS calls it the self. Um, yeah, th there's, so yeah, reconnecting with, uh, with that love or like feeling that love fully was a huge practice, um, partying and then, yeah, getting into parts work. Uh, I, I spent my life like in this total, uh, in retrospect experience of like inner gridlock, like there was a traffic jam of like polarized parts <laughs> and my God, they were, <laughs> nothing was moving. And, uh, you know, when I, when I heard about IFS, I think it was through now Theo, um, it was like our, our lovely neighborhood guide around these parts. Um, one of his, one of his threads, um, just like, well, shit, this makes sense. Now there are parts of me that want different things. And I, all this negative self-talk of how could I possibly want all these different things at the same time? Like, can't I just be clear? Like all the other guys, like just dissolved. And so, yeah, I, I just had, especially last summer, just some like pretty clarifying and freeing, freeing um, experiences of like IFS. And then like, it's, it's maybe more positive companion uh, core transformation. Um, and then, yeah, really got into Robert Bea. And, you know, I, I think uh, his view of like subtlety and, I think framing emptiness, not as this like scary nihilistic thing, but this thing that, yeah, it does free, right? Um, like really practicing um, just a little bit of insight through his his lens went a lot of, went a long way in terms of uh, kind of soft, softening my experience. Yeah. Hmm. Can you say more about how you understand the relationship between IFS and core transformation? Mm. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, this is an approximation, um, or, you know, but, but I think it's true that, uh, so IFS we're looking at parts and yes, intimacy with the whole system is a big part of it, but there's this thrust, especially in therapeutic alliances and therapeutic relationships to 
get to the exiles, find the find the hurt parts of you and unburden them. Um, so you find why they were hurt, you find these burdens that they're carrying and you unburden them. And then you show protectors, these parts of you that make sure you never talk to the exiles. Um, you show the protectors, hey, like you're you're free now. You can you can you know dissolve or find a new a new job. Um, but going into the pain is painful. Um, and there's this other thing, other direction with core transformation, um, where instead of going into the hurt of the parts, we're going into the um, desires of the parts. And so, instead of asking, you know, what are you protecting me from? What are you, you know, what hurt? <laughs> like uh you're asking what do you want and you say and then you put you genuinely it's uh it's an imaginal practice in some sense you know once you figure out what a part wants you genuinely put yourself in that situation where you have that fully and completely and you say okay like you're socially anxious because you don't want me to say something wrong um like and you want you want people to to pay attention to me so you have people's attention fully and completely and no one's going to say anything wrong and uh, you're not going to say anything wrong so you have that then what and you so you repeat that question you say well if you had that past thing fully and completely and it turns out if you continue this uh this loop you end up in kind of a finite set of uh you know what core transformation calls core states um, which are like beingness like just being like deep okayness is uh unconditional love uh so you 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 go into these states and what's amazing about these core states that i've yet to have a core transformation session where that doesn't happen uh these can all be self-generated and so you show the part hey we can just have this whenever we want like we can go into unconditional love for ourselves we can give ourselves okayness if maybe we unblend and we we just take a breather um and so given that we can do this and we can have it fully self-generated, this this first thing in the chain, like, uh, you're, would you really need this? Like, would you really, you know, if you had unconditional love, would you need people's attention? Well, no, I wouldn't need that. Okay, well, if you had unconditional love, would you need to make me socially anxious? Or, or no, I wouldn't need that. And um, yeah, there are a lot of frames of like why this works like it, it seems like there's a really strong there there and I, I i love ifs but like my personal parts work practice is a lot more core transformation than ifs but it, i think it's a really beautiful thing you can almost go two different ways and i think it's quite skillful to go between the ways for different parts different scenarios where there's there's a real hurt here there's a clear like kind of trauma that a central trauma a central story that's driving so let's let's go into part ifs let's Let's unburden that exile. Let's really spend time with it. Or, you know what, let's just go into the desires of the thing and experience these beautiful core states and, uh, yeah, kind of heal the parts via annealing like that way. Um, so, yeah, I think they're they're quite beautiful. I think that like parts work in general, just there are so many different modalities that can be framed in terms of the in terms of parts work. I, that's an area I'm really excited to keep exploring. Mm. That's really helpful. Thank you. I'm curious. So in, in my mental taxonomy, I'm thinking IFS and core transformation are both like philosophies and methods for doing therapy or self-therapy. Um, is that how you see it? And if so, what? how do you understand what the purpose of these therapeutic or self-therapeutic technologies are? It's mm -hmm. a cool question. So I think there are two angles, two levels in which these work really well. And yeah, one is a therapeutic lens where we, we say like I had a, someone, I believe it was Melody, song um say it to me that uh the difference between therapy and coaching is that therapy is like backwards looking where we're going to like try and heal something whereas coaching is like expansion orienting of we're going to try and expand and make you bigger um and so yeah both of those methods and you know the the whole the whole toolkit um can be used really well in a therapeutic lens and i had a huge oh shit moment uh 
like just holy shit moment uh about three months ago when i realized like you know teapot really gravitates towards like five or six uh, different methods therapeutic methods ways of being like ifs alexander technique focusing core transformation and it turns out like there's a single mechanism that kind of drives all of them um or at least claims to it's called memory reconsolidation and the the general vibe is you go into a memory uh you know go into kind of a target schema something that is affecting your behavior in a way that maybe you don't understand or don't quite like and you actually reactivate it so an ifs this would be like meeting a part and like really taking their concern seriously of like oh you're afraid of failing okay i'm gonna feel the fear of failing like really really strongly and really activate the shit out of that 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 feeling and then you know we show it disconfirming beliefs so we show it like well actually look there are all these times that you failed and everyone still loved you or <laughs> yeah and and you really you show it that and like the, the the key thing of memory reconsolidation is you have this like five hour window after activation where there's like some neuroplasticity in that specific part of your brain that's holding that that implicit memory schema or and uh yeah so you know both of these methods like uh use this pretty amazing discovery it was found in 2004 um and i think it explains a lot of why some of these methods that have been around for much longer than 2004 work really well so there is like that therapeutic lens in which they work really well. Um, there's also, I would say just like a Berbea style uh, ways of ways of seeing, like uh, you seeing things in a parts frame is incredibly useful for uh, getting into what's actually going on and uh, kind of getting out of the murk of like, you know, being really in your head and can just give you like a little bit of space. Um, and yeah, same thing with core transformation, this this realization that every single neurosis that you have, every single frustrating behavior that you have at the core of it in both of these and and you know in parts work in general are just trying to help. Like they're just they're just trying to act in your in your benefit. And uh yeah, that's both of those are really beautiful. So like there's there's definitely the therapeutic application, but I really think there's so much territory to explore that i i think i'm like just dipping my toes into compared to like the depth that i think is out there you know uh i'm getting there's this question i want to ask you and i'm getting this metaphor for it which is like it's almost as if you grew up in a specific country and like you kind of thought that was the only country in the world and you were like you know, at the time you were like Christianity and evangelical Christianity and Jesus, and this is the most important thing. And you really saw the value in that. You're like, yeah, this is doing something for me. There's something beautiful here. And then, you know, you kind of like left that country and you saw that there's other countries out there and, you know, you've encountered Buddhism and different, all these different self-therapy techniques and therapeutic modalities we've been talking about. I must wonder, like, I'll ask this question in two ways and you can answer it in either way they're sort of like I, th I think of this as like question synonyms where it's like getting at the same thing but you can ask it either way and so one way of asking would be like how do you understand all of this stuff now and um how do you see it now like what's the worldview that you have now that fits all of this stuff and then the sort of playful way to ask it would be if you could talk to you know your 15 18 year old self and be that was like mm -hmm. very gung-ho on christianity like how would you explain all of the things that you've gotten into what would you tell him about uh the worldview that you have now that's an awesome question cool <laughs> <laughs> um okay so a quick a quick message to the 15 year old of just like keep going uh -huh. <laughs> like great you want to go deep into christianity do it like <laughs> go deeper <laughs> um, uh -huh. I don't know, there's like a certain like epistemic flexibility that comes from having your like view of the world shattered enough times <laughs> and so like that's I, you know i wouldn't be brent without that um <laughs> certain like uh humility there uh yeah burbea's way of seeing and I know there are, there are all sorts of like uh of different people Ken Wilbur has some stuff on this uh just 
this this core I'm, I'm gonna ignore like uh, ontology for a second and just like be in ways of being um the ability to be flexible in ways of seeing uh situations seeing self seeing reality is like incredible and it's freedom amplifying and uh yeah so so just on a personal level like my my belief system is one of like flexibility first but then as i say that i realize that it's much more than that and there's this uh kind of belief in the that unconditional love substrate um you know under everything if we clear out all of our psychological <laughs> accumulated damage maybe over a single lifetime maybe over multiple lifetimes i'm not sure i've incorporated that one in my worldview yet but i i think there's a lot of really beautiful stuff um to that reincarnational lens here like as we as we drop away the layers the only thing that exists is uh, is love um yeah maybe maybe you extend it out to like the brahma viharas being the four things that are at the core of of everyone um that feels very very true um yeah maybe, maybe i'll leave it there nothing else is jumping out hmm. i love that i love that i i think one of the things i'm most interested in with these kinds of conversations it's just how does someone see the world like mm. to me it's it's amazing that we're alive and that there's this universe and it's it's this vast mystery and there's so many different stories and ways of seeing what is happening and almost all it's not this is i mean i really am interested in what the universe is like what's the answer i really want to know <laughs> but also <laughs> Like setting that aside, like there even being a right answer, I think people just the way people see it is so beautiful. It's like an art form in itself to come to some kind of answer about who you are and what the world is and how we're supposed to be related to it or how you want to relate to it. That's like so beautiful. And and to me, when I talk to someone like you, who's seen so many different almost inner landscapes of viewing the world, it's like, oh, that's someone I'm especially curious how they see the world because... Mm -hmm. You know, if someone, I don't know, I, th I think, I think evangelical Christianity is quite interesting, actually. But like, if I just talked to someone who had always been evangelical Christian, never had any crisis of faith, never like questioned it, it's like, well, that's, that still is interesting to me. But I'm, I'm maybe more interested in, in the Brent experience of like, I've been there, and I've been here, and I've been here, and I've been here. And so it's such a treat to just hear you answer that question and hear how you see these things. Oh, lovely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, um, I mean, God bless the people that are, are able to stay in one belief system. And like, I, I have nothing but jealousy and well wishes uh -huh. <laughs> from, the, from uh -huh. the bottom of my heart. Um, yeah, I think like, uh, one thing that definitely came up for me is like, there are like the, there are all these path of insight, uh, like, enlightenment e things that exist out there and i think they're all very interesting and the the theory of mind the nature of mind like i i really love that stuff and i think it's beautiful and excellent to explore like getting deep into perception but i just noticed my energy just naturally goes more towards like the bodhisattva stuff of like yeah awesome we've experienced nature like you know at its at its rawest form and and we've gotten you know we've stripped away suffering but like you know, all all these other people like what are what are we doing like how are we helping um and that does feel that feels incomplete to not mention like just you know whether it be like the missions frame of like we're going to help everyone by letting them know about Jesus or maybe like the the bodhisattva frame of just I'm going to reduce suffering and and you know have maximum deep benefit to people um that also just feels like yeah i met a lot of people of like kind of being that are outside of traditional belief systems and that certainly seems to be a, a common thing that kind of pops up and really beautiful i gotta believe it's like at the core of everyone um yeah hmm. i'm reminded of what you said earlier about as a young man you had these two poles towards being a pastor and being an astrophysicist and then later on like building businesses and um it seems like that 
kind of shape of attention is still alive in you where there's these like draw to the insight practices and seeing things you know learning about what the world is and what your mind is and um also similarly like how can i help people what can i do to actually be a benefit and uh, i think that's such an interesting tension in the ways that that's like manifested through your life at different chapters um, mm, thanks yeah it's a really lovely reflection mm. uh, yeah, there was a there was a core transformation session that I did um, in Thailand earlier this year, um, and it got really visual, really imaginal. Um, it was kind of a an archetypical uh, <laughs> session, and I think that's what's so interesting about the stuff. Like, there's just so much overlap. Like, you can be in a IFS session and get into non dual states. You can be in core transformation and get into soul. Like, it's it's so cool. Um, but yeah, it like really met two archetypes. Like that I just immediately felt like, yes, these are central to me. This, these are me. And it's, uh, yeah, the poet and the the magician and mm -hmm. yeah, the magician wants to go out and wave his wand and help people. And there's also the poet that just wants to be at home in the world and touch, like I almost said touch grass, but touch leaves, um, you know, walk through forests and gardens and just see how beautiful it is and kind of take it in and mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, cool world we live in man like mm -hmm. i hope the next one's also really cool like next time we spawn in <laughs> uh, i love those those archetypes that you tapped into um yeah and i'm you know i love i love that um magician image in so far as to me one of the reasons to talk to you is like i i, I mentioned this earlier but i think you're a badass and i i am inspired by people who do ambitious things and you're doing something ambitious with the refract and um um how to put it you know something i've been working on in the empowerment department with mary is this quest map and uh that document is now on my site people can see it at toshin.com slash quest dash map and um to me you're working on a level four project which is like hey you're banding together to do this effort and it's like, for you, it's starting a company. For someone else, it might be a nonprofit. It could be like, I'm doing this weird thing with the cervix skilled. I don't even know what that's going to be. But like, that's a level four endeavor. And it's like, yeah, you're a level four hero. I'm doing this badass thing. And I want to learn about that. And mm -hmm. it occurs to me, you know, going into starting Refract, like you had a lot of experience. You know, you started businesses quite young and were working on different things and ha had been in a lot of different uh, business contexts and working on different projects. Like, what do you think the skills are that you brought in going into that, that like made it possible for you to even consider starting a company? And like, what did it like almost uh, like if, if you were like a hero playing a, like a role playing game, like what was on your character sheet that nice. let you <laughs> do that? Like what, what makes a badass a badass is really what I'm asking. <laughs> Tell me, Brent. Tell me about yourself, please. And as I always say with Mary, like, please brag about yourself. This is your opportunity to brag. Like, I won't see it as bragging or, you know, it's like, no, I really want to know what makes you tick, you know? Cool. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. With with everything I, I say, almost always, like, I would love to stay in a descriptive frame rather than a prescriptive frame. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. You know, but uh, yeah, I'd say like the, I, I heard this Sam Altman interview when I was like 20 that just like made it click of, uh, you know, if you're, I don't necessarily buy into the, the language here perfectly um, anymore, but if you're 1% better per day, then, oh, you know, after five years, you're like something like a hundred times better and more impactful than you were. And all you have to do is just focus on like, make that 1% improvement today. Um, and I think this like, uh, yeah, my, my model of these things is just all about feedback loops of how do I have a personal feedback loop so that I can learn things quickly. And I was really lucky to be around some very fast learners um, and some very experienced like kind of you know, learners. So if you want to take like that on your skill sheet, like learning how to learn is like really important. But then, yeah, just finding what the core feedback loop that's going to drive the business, it's going to drive the impact that you want. And really aggressively uncomfortably ignoring everything else that's not that for as much as you possibly can um and 
there's some interesting interplay here because I think like there's a lot of value to side quests and a lot of um, value of like, yeah, find the one thing and like push the gas pedal and go down the one path, but doing side quests, keeping things fun, not just staying on the one track. And, you know, I think like there's a lot of dance and play that maybe that attitude kind of precludes that I think is really important for, for longevity here, for, for like keeping your energy up for doing your best type of work. But yeah, um, that that's definitely the commonality of the people that I've met that have done really well. Um, you know, like mentors and friends of just, they, they have a ton of focus on the top thing. Um, if they don't know what the top thing is, there's like, you know, all hands on deck to get clarity, ask the, ask their advisors, have the meetings, go on the walks, the vacations to like really figure out what the one thing they want to drive is solve that one thing and then figure out the next one and, and then set up feedback loops kind of as you, as you go. Um, yeah. Uh, these are these are like my past life uh learnings of like what if i really had to distill it down into two there are some things that i've learned like since i since i started refract maybe on the software side of like cool well now we now we know i think it's really easy to drive yourself mad um if you know that next thing that you're supposed to be doing and it's just a long way in the future because you're having a ambitious like multi-year project and so yeah making it fun for yourself uh feels really important the uh like just treating everyone as humans around you, <laughs> like uh, taking breaks, like uh, Joe Hudson uh, uh, on the Art of Accomplishment podcast had this amazing episode recently on the burnout cycle that really resonated with me. Of Like uh, you are in these environments, especially when you care this much. Um, if you're living under urgency, you're draining from your adrenal gland pretty strongly. And it's really possible to get to a point where like you have that coffee and it just does nothing to you where you jump off the cliff for skydiving or you know, bungee jumping and you feel nothing like you can push yourself um, hard enough and in like this urgent mind state where you just aren't able to function anymore and aren't able to really feel. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of my thinking now is just like, great, we know the we know the two things like focus on the top thing, set up the feedback loop that are going to like drive us to a level hundred character, but let's make sure we're not like quitting the game, like <laughs> by, by pushing too hard, by trying to, trying to go too fast. Um, yeah. I don't know if that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. I love all that. What are some things that you learned from different mentors that you had or peers that you had, uh, yeah yeah so my uh my first boss eric he's like this badass that started you know five different industrial software companies and um yeah cool dude and was incredibly generous like i was this green 22 year old um just ready to get into it and uh you know just over i'd say overly enthusiastic but definitely enthusiastic about writing code and, and tech and all that and uh, he kind of took me under his wing and taught me so much of what he knows um but yeah from him i got this uh really uncomfortable to be honest like focus on the top priority of like hey you know the 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 uh the shed in the back is on fire like shouldn't we go put that out and he's like nope we have to focus on on this thing in the kitchen like we have to finish the dish the shed can wait the shed is not the thing that matters the the dish that we're making right now will make make or break like what we're doing so that, like relentless like focus on the critical path like prioritization there um yeah and i don't know it's hard to there, there's just this attitude i was really blessed to meet this group of like amazing startup founders and entrepreneurs right out of school. Um, they were all, we were all like roughly the same age, all roughly the same. Like we had all picked our, you know, level four business that we were going to start and we were just going to, we were going to grow with it from like, you know, as 22 year olds all the way through. And yeah, it's been about seven years since that group was founded and just like the sheer amount of like harder lessons you get from osmosis um it just i don't think there's any substitute for it like just this feeling of like oh things are 
this really big thing just happened. We're going to, we're going to be all right. We're going to have to work a little harder, but we're going to stay the course. Like just, yeah, it's been amazing. Like the honesty that, that they've shared and you know, just hearing other businesses stories. Like this is not a thing that's unique to them or unique to like our group where just tough things happen. Like <laughs> co-founders die, like, uh, tough funding environments come tough funding environments go and just being able to go and stay the course and trust like i'm trusting yourself enough to survive this stuff and not go crazy uh really picked up from them um yeah so those are like those two especially are my are my big influences but then we could get into business books and all that and spend a couple hours talking about the favorites there mm. how did refract come about mm. So uh, backing up the uh, the sabbatical was lovely. It was good. I needed time to do absolutely nothing. And my dad would call me like weekly and say like, "Hey, so um, yeah, you know, I just I just want to be able to explain to the people that I go to cocktail parties with, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, it's you know, it's it's been two months, Brent. Like, what are you?" it's been six months, Brent. Oh, it's been nine months, Brent. Like what are, what's going on here? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there was just this recognition of like, I just need time to allow everything to drop and see what naturally comes. Like, uh, you know, I'll drop all the shoulds and watch whatever wants happen. Um, you know, follow what's energetic or follow what's fun um, rather than just the things that like I had decided uh, before that were important. So yeah, about like, 10 months into that process, I was sitting in a, of like doing all this self healing of allowing like non coercion. I, you know, I'm not a non coercion maxer, but I do think that like a time of devoted non coercion is really, really important for a specific type of person. And I was definitely one of them. Um, yeah. So after that, like 10 month period of like kind of just kind of hanging around and waiting for something to emerge, like I was sitting in a, uh, sitting in a hammock in Thailand. I, was reading Ursula Le Guin's Earth Sea. I had a joint in my hand. The sun was shining. Like maybe the most perfect moment I've experienced, one of them. Uh, but there was just this like the breeze was coming in, this cool feeling. And I just realized, like, wow, this whole year I've had a feeling that something is wrong. Like I there's something wrong with me that I have to fix something. There's something wrong with the world. Like, and actually like we're all right. We're okay. And yeah, I got this feeling that I had for the first time in my life that actually I can kind of like, I can run the race. Like I can, I can live to 85, 90 and you know, I don't, I don't feel this existential weight on me anymore. We're free. And like, just, it was like a full body felt sense shift uh, that happened. And yeah, it took about three days from that to my hands are on the keyboard and we're writing like prototype code uh gpt4 had just come out and like it was just a sense of like yeah okay now that i've had that moment now that i know it's it's time to go uh yeah hmm. so what well maybe it'd be helpful to say what refract is and then i'm curious like how that particular idea was what you decided to work on awesome yeah definitely so Refract is a self therapy assistant. Um, I I did a lot of therapy, a lot of self therapy over my sabbatical, and um, yeah, just saw how powerful this stuff is. Like things were moving in me that I didn't know could move, and so um, I'm building our team is building something to help people do self-therapy effectively like it's a it's a full system so it, there's the, the the heart of it is an ai guide uh leads you through a voice session where you're following the ifs or core transformation or focusing script and i think we'll we'll go beyond that eventually um yeah, full a full session there, but then there's also this system around it. So the the full picture is you on Tuesday or out with your friends, someone says something, you have a confusing emotional reaction. Like maybe you 
shut down or maybe you have an anger response, a flash anger response. And so then, you know, you can take a sec, go for a smoke break, hit the bathroom, um, leave a voice note uh, for a couple minutes of just here's what's going on. Here's what I'm feeling. Just like try and stream of consciousness, the activation and um, yeah, maybe use a, a tool like a, a mode that we have to just like unblend you and calm you down and ground you um, to help you kind of get through that activation. Um, but then that Thursday, you come in for your scheduled session, and this will be an hour long IFS session. And the guide reads your words back to you. Like it, it helps you get activated, it helps you get into that moment, um, which yeah, can be very challenging with any type of therapy, um, and especially when you're sitting alone and there's not another human to really prompt you and feel into you. Um, so you get activated, and then you do a full IFS session. Um, on that thing you have the insight you have the emotional release come out and then yeah as it's implemented right now you uh, have integration journal prompts where you go in and you're prompted for the next couple weeks to go in and spend time with the exile that you met in that ifs session or like hang out with the protectors and just see how they're doing um so you're going to journal about it we'll also uh probably early in the new year, have some meditations that you do. So like audio meditations where, you know, it's customized to that part and you're going in, talking to them, visualizing them playing and just spending time. And so kind of go through this discovery process of here are my triggers. Let's capture them when they happen. And, you know, some people say they just like to go into a session then. And I think that's awesome. Like maybe it's a really, really long bathroom break that they, that they sneak off for once they get triggered. So, but yeah, the, the, just, Discovery happens, transformation happens in a session, and then the integration happens over time. And yeah, my hope is this kind of builds a, a nice feedback loop um, as you as you go and kind of an engine to to help people's inner work. And yeah, our team has been using it uh, weekly. We've been having weekly sessions with the guide and finding like a ton of value. This is also a big problem. So uh, it's it's been about nine months of working on it. And uh, yeah, I'd say we're we're getting closer to something that's like magical, easy, great. Um, but we're still we're still cranking away on it. Um, yeah. And then what was the what was the second half of the question? Assuming that all made sense. Yeah. How did it? Um, well, like, why did you decide to work on this project in particular? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it definitely just you build the thing that you're gonna want to use, and so that that was very easy. Um, I. I got really into climate tech because I wanted to help save the earth. And at a certain point, I just decided that narrative of like Brent, the savior just wasn't holding up on like a individual mythical level. We'll call it. Um, it just, it actually was doing a lot of harm to me, believing I was, you know, not the only one, but I needed to save the earth. There was something that I needed to do um, there. And yeah, kind of stepping away from, and not allowing any Brett saves the world, world narratives um, and following where my energy went. The next thing is I just find emotions really fucking fascinating. Like my, my first therapist, the one that kind of woke me up from head living in the head to kind of moving closer to the heart, at least he was a, a really lovely union analyst. Um, said this thing where the, your, your inner work, your inner world is as rich as the outer world. We just have to spend the time to discover that. And um, yeah, as I've gotten into the inner world stuff, it's just, it's so rich. It's so fascinating. I can't hear people's stories enough. And so there was just this recognition of uh, whatever company, whatever product I create, I want to be in it to run it for eight to 10 years. And yeah, climate tech, robotics, like, machine learning that stuff's fucking cool and if i hadn't burned out i probably that was a topic i was capable of doing for 10 years this thing i i know i'm gonna be like i, I just cranking at this over the long term because i really love it and uh yeah that felt like a really important prerequisite so yeah it felt really lucky to kind of find something at the intersection of a lot of what i believed what was important to you about finding a project that you thought that you could work on for eight to 10 years? Hmm. Yeah, I think that 
the benefit of so many projects. Like if we go with this 1% growth daily um, or maybe 5% growth weekly, like the benefit of so many projects, so many initiatives happen like past year five or six, like because they've had the time for the founder to gain experience, to gain like to become a true expert, like the team, an amazing team to build up around them, like have have that depth um, to really meet something well. And then enough time to actually like grow in the market in a mature way, not in a like flash sugar candy model where we're just going to dump some VC money on something and, and grow fast, but like really deepen into a market and uh, yeah. And, and map it. So, you know, if all the, I won't say all the gold, but like so much of the gold for me is like after year five, um, because that's more really, really cooking, but uh, you know, <laughs> That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. So um, yeah, I think it was just really important to find something that was like super central to me so that I could really run the race. And, and maybe it's longer than 10 years. That'd be cool too. Like I'd, I'd love to just keep running this baby. How long has it been now? A bit over a year? Mm. It's been about uh, nine months. Yeah. Yeah. Nine months. Mm. Going back to what the app is, how do you talk to users about IFS versus focusing versus I think core transformation is the third one you said. Um, you gotta... Like, how do you tell them what, what these modalities are and help them to choose which one to use? Yeah, definitely. So uh, for now, we've just hidden core transformation because I think there's like a education thing, like I'll use it personally, but we're not going to launch it publicly until we have like a better story around it. Um, IFS and focusing, or rather focusing and X, uh, have a really interesting relationship. I think focusing is like this fundamental primitive that makes any other therapy work really well. And like, you know, that, that's how it was designed. Like uh, Eugene Jenlin went in and looked at thousands of therapy sessions, said, where did people actually have change? Where did they not? And it turns out like, if you listen to a felt sense shift in your body and feel that happen, um, you know, and really are in touch with what's emerging, uh, the the unspeakable thing, um, rather than the easy to access words. If you if you're listening for that, change just naturally kind of happens and, and efficacy. So, yeah, the the story that we tell um, is start with focusing. Really learn how to tune into that that felt sense. This is this is the you know like the first primitive uh, skill. The second one is emotional regulation, like emotional self-regulation. And uh, yeah, we're just about to finish a cohort uh, of five people that we haven't talked about publicly much, but uh, yeah, kind of trying to teach these prerequisite skills to people and like learning about your emotion or your nervous system, learning how to breathe, learning how to box breathe, how to bring yourself back, how to ask parts to unblend, like, especially when you're doing this work alone. You know, if you can listen to to a part, listen to a felt sense well enough, you're going to uncover some like uh, surprising psychological material. And sometimes that can be very distressing. And so being able to self-regulate through that feels like the, the second thing um, that we really try and communicate and make sure that for now, just all of our users can self-regulate well. Um, we're not going to put someone on the platform unless they're really... Uh, we feel after talking to them that we're confident that we're setting them up for success. Um, and then, yeah. So then you have those prerequisites and that feeds into IFS or core transformation. And like, uh, now that you have all that, you know how to listen to yourself, you know how to like hold whatever comes up. Well, um, you know, we're, we're going to jump into it. Hmm. What have you learned through this nine months about running this company? Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah so i came in with this view of like i was a founder when i was 20 and then i took a break from it like i was first hire at a company and then i you know was early advisor and like had a software another one like but now I'm back. We're back, like founder time. And there was this like almost uh I don't know, like fabrication that was happening where I wasn't really like interacting with the company as it was. I was interacting with uh 
my idea of what it should be. And uh, yeah, what that looked like was like when I was hiring people, when I was bringing in contractors, it was very cold of like, here's the work that needs to be done. Here's who you are. I think you can do that. Do that work and we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it was very uh, by the books. And uh, yeah, I had a, a dear friend kind of have a tough conversation with me when I was asking him like, oh my God, I'm so stressed. Like, I don't know how to how to really uh, lead people, manage people well. And and yeah, it was Simon Oler, um, who is one of my favorite, favorite humans. He's one of the three people I go to like for advice um, when, when things uh, are challenging. Uh, he, you know, and this time he nailed it as usual. Like he just said, Brent, it sounds like you're not treating the people in your company as people. Like, mm-hmm. You are managing the position, not the individual. And if you just back out and relax and see them as people, you might find a lot of these problems relax and go away. So yeah, that was like, that was a huge fucking learning. And I think like healed a lot of (laughs) maybe personal, like viewing myself as like, I am CEO, I must do CEO thing and open up a lot of freedom to just be, be Brent running Brent's company and being CEO, but all that. So yeah, that was a huge deal. And then this like this phrase of um, leading from my limits has come up a lot where, um, okay, I am Brent running a company as Brent. And Brent's pretty good at some things. That's cool. Um, Brent's also not good at everything. <laughs> and uh, I've had some relentlessly talented people around me that sometimes can just grind through any problem, it seems like, from the outside. Um and just allowing myself to have limits and ask for help uh, pretty aggressively from people has been has been lovely. Um, I, I really found like, yeah, it, it's amazing that what one person's limits are um, and weaknesses are, another person is just obsessed. Like I met someone that just begged me for, do you have any bureaucracy problems that are affecting your business? Like I just love dealing with bureaucracy and paperwork. And like, we didn't at the time, but like, holy hell, that's a human that exists. <laughs> and like, mm-hmm. That's not, that's not Brent. So. <laughs> it's, it's pretty You're giving cool. me their contact information after this right now. <laughs> yes, <sir>. Oh man. <laughs> uh, it's a good friend and I would love to, if that's what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I guess the last thing is just, um, especially with this kind of work, like I'm building a thing that is being inserted into other people's inner worlds and uh, learning to dance with the responsibility of that. Um, I, I I was very heavy and hard and responsibility and ethics focused uh, when I first started the business and I still very much am, but I was like, I was creating just this massive weight on my shoulders of like total responsibility for what happens inside a session. And um yeah being able to being able to play with that and just recognize ultimately yeah (laughs) i think we've already proven that a lot of good stuff can come in this container like some of our early users like are really loving it and that's so beautiful and we're getting like beautiful stories happening through what we made and also um yeah i guess my ultimately my job is just to do the work myself like make sure that I'm I'm taking care of me. I'm growing. I I'm not just staying static and and very like yin or yang focused of like I'm gonna build this product and it's gonna work and it's gonna work exactly like this. Remain receptive to whatever emerges, keep doing the work myself, go on retreat, have the therapist, and just trust that that, that good things will emerge from there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would you give any advice to someone like another level four hero, for example, that was like embarking on starting a company or a nonprofit or some kind of ongoing project like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say first, like just that asking for help, like just recognizing, like, I don't, it's so cheesy, but just don't play other people's game. Like, (laughs) <laughs> they're really good at their game because they're them, but you're also clearly good at what you're doing because you're you. Um, so do that. And then if you're playing your game, you're going to hit points where you're not 
you're you're not necessarily strong and something does need to happen and just building up that muscle of asking for help um yeah had a meditation this this last saturday and this like sentence kept coming to me of um you know helps only a desperate word if it's held too long <laughs> and um yeah so just ask receive it like learn to receive people are so joyful <laughs> to 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 give give their expertise um and then yeah uh, especially for people that are are doing this alone uh, which i'm i'm currently doing uh at least as a founder i've like awesome advisors awesome teammates that i'm really thankful for um it can get lonely and hard man and you got to make sure you're surrounding yourself with love loving relationships people that see you that don't see refract <laughs> don't see whatever you're building um they see a person that wants and needs care just like everyone else. And yeah, I think it's really important for a leader to be the emotional center of his company. I take that very seriously. Like I, I want to remain in self as much as possible. That's my first job as a CEO and I want to be the emotional center, but I'm only able to do that because I have people that have my back. And so making that, super fucking explicit and taking that seriously and then just like enjoying it that these people do love you and want to support you um i i think i've maybe learned that less than 25 percent, and I, I look forward to a deepening is man that that network i couldn't do it without without them mm, really i love this story about what simon told you about uh treating the people you're working with as people and also that you kind of learned you needed to treat yourself like that as well. And um, I don't know, I, part of the reason I'm interested in this is that's been a really big value for me of um, like caring about the relationship first and caring about the friendship first. And I want, if I'm collaborating with someone or working with them, then I want to care about the friendship first and foremost. And if it feels like the friendship is threatened or like at risk in some way by collaborating or having some other kind of relationship that I want to just like do whatever it takes to come back to just the friendship first and foremost. And that includes like ending a collaborative relationship or something like that, if need be, or changing it so that um, it feels better to be in relationship and in friendship. And I'm curious what that's been like for you and what it means to be like relating to people as people first and foremost, like what your experience of that has been yeah yeah it's been really beautiful just watching you as you're building your organization like uh and yeah taking that seriously so yeah it's uh yeah you're i feel very lucky to call you a peer kind of building mm -hmm. <laughs> building all this um yeah i uh, it was really hard leaving my last job when i quit for sabbatical that was one of the things the toughest things <laughs> I've had to do um and it was also like one of the most immediate reliefs that's happened um I was working with my best friends uh working for them and my brother uh working with my little brother and uh there was so much good there and also um who who I am and who I show up in the world and how my best friend that I was working for show up in the world are different and um i fucking love him so much <laughs> and also uh the friendship was getting absolutely ruined and uh you know after i quit i we took three months of of no contact i just needed space um because i i love him i loved him like a brother but i it hurt too much and um it, it became very clear yeah, after about three months and when we reunited, you know, just one, that was necessary. And two, like, okay, actually there can be a friendship here again. Like there can be life. And uh yeah, like life's too short. Those kind of brothers are too rare. So um you know, not not something I'm planning on uh <laughs> repeating, getting that close to losing someone I love so much. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that story. I know it's uh yeah, one of the hardest things you've 
had to go through and I hear how important that relationship was to you and it feels like a privilege to hear about that so thank you mm. yeah definitely yeah it's um yeah it's been fun doing this like heart-centered and actually listening to the motions this time around because mm. yeah that like <laughs> some stuff is obvious of like oh well no it's just like this isn't working both of us are are forcing ourselves into a shape and like all right maybe this isn't it like i i i can see that that being very obvious so yeah what does that look like for you right now as a manager that's sort of trying to come from the heart and relating to people first and foremost like what is what's your experience of like of that like now mm -hmm. um yeah the thing that most is most alive here is just making space like <laughs> Uh, just being able to hold space and be in like, yeah, IFS has the beautiful picture of self and self energy is something that exists and it's something that can be extended to another person. And just being in a meeting, being in self, hearing them speak and allowing them to be in more self as they speak because they're around for a reason and I'm really glad they're around. And, um, you know, however I can <laughs> make make this person be be the most of them is uh is where i win and then i just trust that the right people are going to be in the company over time um yeah that's that's a big one and then yeah maybe just yeah again just making space like I, i'm going to trust that the right people come and it's just it's really humbling to watch refract like the people that'll come in and just say hey can i like work for free for a couple of months for the company i just love what you're doing or can i can i offer this or can i offer that and like just the quality of people that like really deeply care about other people's well-being like that's an amazing filter for for having like really competent and heart-led people of their own um so that's been amazing so given that i can trust like the right people are are coming at my door because i'm following my vow and i'm following you know what i see as the greatest good that i can do um i then can just trust that now that they're here i just need to let them go and support them and and be here to to support that so yeah mm. Mm. what do you feel like is your growth edge as a leader and an entrepreneur mm -hmm. I am quite ADHD, <laughs> not, not, not on the extreme end, but I'm, I'm pretty solidly there. And that gives me amazing advantages of creativity and flexibility and energy and bursts. And, uh, it also means like, yeah, like time blindness is a thing of just time not fundamentally feeling real and like tomorrow not not really existing like I know I know my calendar says that those meetings exist but I'll see it when I believe it <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that makes organization hard that makes following up and uh, it's something I've been really lucky to to learn from a few people in my life um, is just like the value of integrity or really what it means to have another person around that is has integrity and when they say they'll do something they'll either let me they'll either do it or they'll let me know later that they were not able to do it or they won't be able to do it and i can trust that and um yeah it's definitely a growth edge to really like step into that integrity myself um you know low integrity doesn't feel like it describes me as a person but also like yeah if we uh, I, I want people to be able to rely on me organizationally so that, yeah, that definitely has my, has my mind. And yeah, it's just fun to have something that I really care about because it makes like this kind of like <laughs> this kind of work that could be scary or daunting, like, I don't know, just infinite upside if I get it. Do you have a sense of how you hope things might unfold in the coming years for a fact? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Short term, we want to make an incredible solo IFS tool. Um, I would love to have more partnerships to support that, like uh, you know, meeting and like partnering with like the IFS Institute, like a few other like these amazing people that are running, 
and like developing these methods and educating people like i i want to I want to do this right. So I want to do IFS right. But then there are all these other parts work uh, modalities. There are all these different like journaling review practices, like, and I'd love to just translate them into a factor that, you know, AI can deliver that you can do on your own, like kind of expanding and then having the educational infrastructure to tie all these things together. So, you know, teapot, like one of the commonalities that I've noticed, especially in like meditation and self-therapy teapot is like, people have tried a fuck ton of modalities and they did that by reading the textbook and going through and like calling the person, the expert and finding the guide. And it's a, it's a whole hunt to, to get into this stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, making it easier for that person to jump in, find the modality that clicks for you and then go deep on it. Um, you know, it feels, feels really important. So that's like, that's maybe the the two year product vision, like that we're really just nailing a lot of different modalities. We're translating things to do well on your own. Um, I, I want community built into this thing. This is uh, like solo work is very solo. It's very lonely. And so having a group of peers that you're doing this work with, uh, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's people that we introduce you to feels very important, but you know, I, I do not want people just living so like I don't want to be empowering people to just live solitary lives where they're not depending on other people and celebrating wins with each other. Um, so you know we we've got to nail the core tech first. We've got to nail the IFS experience, really understand how to do it well, but then expanding it out uh, once we have that to kind of create these cohort peer structures feels important. And then if we like zoom out all the way, um, Daniel Thornson had uh, an amazing podcast that he like repodcasted recently with uh with a guy by the name of john churchill where they talked about the three strands of awakening um of emotional individuation um soul work and then spiritual awakening and when i heard that it was just an instant body yes this is it like <laughs> ken wilbur has uh clean up grow up show up um and then the last up the yeah it's not there, but um, I wake up, I think. Wake up. Thank you. Yeah. So also has a similar framework, but like I heard those three and just said, yep, that's it. So bringing more soul, especially into the app, I think there's like some amazing uh, things that we can do to facilitate like solo shamanic journeying or imaginal work that I'd love to, I'd love to just support people through. Um, and yeah, maybe there's something on the spiritual awakening side. I just, I, I view that that meta framework is informing our work so much and we have to nail the basics and we have to nail the core experience and we're going to get there. Um, but then expanding out into how can we help this like holistic, non-linear, chaotic, beautiful human, like navigate those three strands um, feels, yeah, it just feels exciting. Like that's, that's the kind of shit. Like I, I wake up excited to build. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I love that. You know, it occurs to me that, hmm, you know, this is, I think, a really exciting moment for our species and our history. And so far as, I don't know, I've always been interested in technology and like, you know, I read, I read Bill Gates book, The Road Ahead in, in the 90s, I think, and like when I was like eight or nine or 10 or so, maybe 10 or 12 or something, I forget. So it might have been early 2000s. Anyway, that book just like really inspired me. I was like, oh, wow, he, he really understands something and they're, these are going to unfold. And um, I think the arrival of AI has just been so fascinating to watch and so cool and made a lot of things possible in my own life. And it, to me, it feels like, okay, there were like smartphones in like 2008 and there's the internet in the nineties. And like, these are kind of huge milestones of, what's possible. And um, I feel like you have a really interesting vantage point to that transition because you're one of the early people building something on AI. And I wonder what your perspective about AI is and like what you've learned from building a tool on it and sort of how you see it or any, any thoughts or experiences you have that you'd like to share about that. Mm, cool. Cool. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say all this with humility first that uh, I, I'm building a business on AI, but I'm not building an AI business. Like that feels very important to me. Like I'm, mm -hmm. 
I want to translate what what works these known these known methods for self inquiry self work and yeah the AI is the tool it's the enabler um, and yeah so that for self for self I, I'm not an AI expert I'm very much a translational researcher if you want to call me that um, mm -hmm. I don't know man shit's cool I, maybe that's how I'm describing it <laughs> like uh -huh. holy shit this is uh -huh. This is a really exciting time to be to be a human. Um, mm -hmm. I I have doubts as far as like when or how the current methods will scale beyond like GPT four level capacity. Um, it seems like we're training data limited in a lot of ways, and uh, we're, we've kind of used all the text written of all time by humanity to train these models, and we're not getting much more. Um, so. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of like uh, short term pessimism or just skepticism of like th this pace of of continual improvement uh, kind of keeping going on. But at the same time, I I fully expect to be wrong. <laughs> and it's like, uh, yeah, something something amazing is happening. And uh if we want to use the word golden age, if we want to use the word heaven realm, like it certainly seems like we're out of the great stagnation of like, you know, the, the seven seventies through the uh, early tens and like some cool shit is starting to move. And that's awesome. I think, you know, there's some dystopian uh, futures that we're already living in. Like, uh, yeah, I think part of the reason why, self therapy is so crucial and necessary now is because of all the micro traumas that we're receiving from like an overly stimulated and connected world like that most people just there are skills you need and most people are not taught those skills and um so like that's there's some sadness here um and also whoa anyone can create the art that they want and that's only going to get better anyone's going to be able to type in and create a like feature film um just from like a a, a script <laughs> like this this is unbelievable and from an art perspective from a like possible deliverable good to humans and like maximum benefit from all beings perspective there's so much opportunity out there um so mm -hmm. yeah it's cool man I, I feel very lucky to be to be in the middle of it and just the excitement um i'm a part of a group of people building in AI and wellness uh, and just like watching what other people are building and watching the excitement that they bring. And uh, yeah, it feels like, and uh, yeah, I'm just lucky. I'm lucky. Yeah. Have you had any specific like holy shit moments using AI over the last couple of years where you've been like, Oh, that blew my mind. Mm -mm. I'm uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, on again and off again relationship with these models because uh there's it's they're very good at like quick shallow demos and then trying to get them to go deep and follow um like the ifs script in an ethical and safe way we've had a lot of fun trying to get that to actually work. yeah just a ton of fun um, yeah. so i i just want to acknowledge the part of me that's like well you know fuck that like you uh -huh. won't even listen to my instructions um yes i've had uh, some just yeah, the holy shit moments just seem to keep going. Um, hmm. The uh, yeah, in Thailand, making the first prototype of Refract and realizing, oh wait, I think I can just create a a loop where I just describe the project I want and just feed the whole project into GPT four and ask it to modify and and it just like I built the first version of Refract that way of just like not actually writing most like about fifty percent, sixty percent of the code myself, and it was just like holy shit, this thing actually can do it. Like it actually works. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that using the voice, the voice feature of uh chat GBT was also amazing. And, and yeah, just like all the, I don't know, they're not like holy shits. They're like micro holy shit. So just, oh yeah, I guess it can just answer that question. And I was going to spend three weeks trying to figure out this dumb browser compatibility issue. And it just gave me the answer immediately. Like, Holy shit, my life is better with this. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I remember the first holy shit moment I had with this stuff was last year I wrote my first novel and I don't know, I, I it was like a 
vulnerable moment for me of like, oh, I, because I, I'd really, really, really wanted to write a novel as a teenager. And then I like set that dream aside for a long time and was kind of reawakening it. And um, I loved what I wrote, but it was also, it was such, it's such a weird novel that I wrote. And it's actually, it's it, like each of the characters are like parts that I've worked with and, or like fictionalized versions of parts that I've worked with. And um, anyway, I remember I fed chat GPT, like a couple of chapters of the novel and asked it to like do literary criticism of it, like in the style of specific literary critics and comparing it to like Wolf and Joyce and Hesse and stuff who were definitely subconscious influences for me. And then it like spit out like very good, like, you know, this is the, ch I was like, you know, and it hadn't even been published public. Like there was no way it could. It, so it like just immediately spewed out literary criticism. And I was like, this crazy it was so cool to read too I was, I was like oh wow it noticed things about the novel that i hadn't noticed as the person who wrote it. i was like oh wow that's that's astute <laughs> you're, you're totally right <laughs> so, good job, good job. yeah yeah <laughs> that really blew my mind um um yeah that's really cool yeah mm -hmm. um it's also it's just great I, I i really appreciated your influence on just like yeah you just keep making art and <laughs> i think there's something to be said of like yeah, all this, all this self therapy stuff is really important, and knowing your parts, knowing all that. But um, at a base level, like being surrounded by loving relationships and making art and going outside and drinking water seems to work really well for ninety nine percent of what a human needs. <laughs> and like, maybe all this just exists to like push us back to that. Um, but like, man, the art you've been making is so awesome, mm. and it it inspires me to do it myself. So, yeah. mm. thank you, Brent. That does make me want to ask about our shared interest of music and uh you know we both love the edm and i wonder how did you start making music what 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 got you into doing music production mm -hmm. yeah so it was um i i noticed there are like two two paths into um music production there's a i'm a dj and i want to mix things together and ooh, now i can make my own sounds and then there's the autist path and i'm i'm more of that one um so i found this synthesizer tutorial and i thought it was really cool that you could turn waves that did like a sinusoidal wiggly shape and they turned into sound if you play them fast enough at a high enough frequency and then you could do mathematical alterations to those waves and it changed the sound that came out and I thought that was just the coolest shit and so I I followed that synth tutorial all the way through I think it's called Sintorial is the name of it um and had a ton of fun with that and I was just making weird noises and and then I realized like oh yeah I can just I can just make songs now and so I made, I kind of did like a version of NaNoWriMo where I was just making a song, a, a mini song a day um, with a programming language that was modifying sine waves directly and scheduling them and sequencing them. And yeah, made a, a bunch of just absolutely terrible shit that I had so much fun making. Um, and, yes. and then it took about like a year to realize like, oh shit, I can just like take samples that other people have made and drag them in and then make my own sounds that kind of work well with them and you know I, the, the process goes much faster but man i have a lot of fondness for those early uh <laughs> nerding out moments um yeah hmm. how are you making your own sounds when you're doing that what did that process involve yeah it was this ruby library that i was using um it's, it's not sonic pi maybe it's sonic pi something like that um but yeah, it was, uh, I started there and quickly hit the limits of that. Uh, I could, you know, it could make specific beeps and boops. And if you really knew your stuff, you could make some pretty sophisticated sounds. Um, so yeah, then I went into, uh, Ableton and, uh, yeah, the amount of sound design that you can do there, you can just get lost tweaking a single noise. Like I've spent entire days just like designing a single synth and had a lot of fun with it and then kind of put it off to the side and continued with my life. Um, yeah. The, the amount of uh, like expertise on YouTube that you, you can pull in um, with Ableton uh, specifically, it's just like, it's tremendous and it, it's fun as hell. I think if, if I were to go back in time, I'd probably just say, Hey Brent, that's really awesome. Let's like 
let's do some samples. Like I got really discouraged after a while because I could make the sounds that I could hear in my head real, but I couldn't make songs. And I think like, you know, setting up the right feedback loops, right? Like being able to complete a song is a huge point that you can then improve. Like, yeah, you, know, you don't just want to design a brush and procreate. Maybe you do like being able to create a full painting, put it aside, create another full painting. Um, so yeah, so when I discovered the sample stuff, that's when we really started moving. And then, yeah, taking taking mushrooms was awesome for my music. Like, oh my God, man. I, I went from not loving the stuff I created. I took mushrooms, made music the next day. And it was like, wait, this is the first time I've actually like enjoyed, enjoyed listening back. Like, this is great. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something about listening to your body uh during and and the creativity uh that comes from that but yeah it's it's been a path it's been a path what were the some of the skills that you needed to learn after you started using ableton mm. uh i guess like going roughly in order like uh taste <laughs> learning how what I liked and what I didn't like um rhythm like knowing what the rhythm that was driving that was uh melody like what how is it actually how's how are the notes moving through this thing in a central way harmony like what's set up to support those I I had played piano before but uh I didn't know what a chord really was besides just a thing that I played. And so all these like music theory. So there's like music theory of harmony to support the melody, um, sample selection, like looking for samples and finding them um, in a cohesive way that they actually work together. Uh, sound design where you're modifying the samples and modifying the synths that you've modifying the melody and harmony to all work together. Like you only have so much uh, kind of bandwidth that you can, stick sounds into um otherwise it sounds really muddy you know you you add like a car horn and a uh a, a, a man screaming next to each other and like they actually occupy like uh pretty similar frequencies and so you can't hear them super clearly so separating out the samples and things that you picked out so that they all work together well and then yeah uh i would say like then composition so like you go from like melody, harmony, rhythm, creating a loop that's really nice 16 seconds. How do you change that so it's not boring to listen to? You're not just listening to 30 seconds. You're listening to these things. How do you create dynamicism in the group, uh, like in the in the music, like both, like on all of those levels, you can alter the rhythm, you can alter the melody, you can alter the harmony to create these different things. Um, you can alter the effects to create like maybe tension to release tension. Um, yeah, and there's so much more. It's such a deep, deep subject. I, uh, yeah, I've realized that I can't get fully deep into it while I'm running a company, and also there's a part of me that just wants to go over and and spend a couple months just living in Ableton again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the genres and artists that you really like? Mm. Um. Yeah, I'm all about the uh, Andrew Nadeep, like progressive house, just the that light shit that just makes me feel good. <laughs> um, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, and then beyond that, like uh, that's kind of daily, daily listens, daily, daily use. Um, I mean, I definitely listen pretty broadly, like for enjoyment, but that's more um, not not like background soundtrack stuff more I'm going to sit down and listen to an album for 30 minutes and it's going to be a cool jazz album or something um and then there's the whole category of Brent's going out we want to get in a trance state um we want a consistent like techno four on the floor with not too much going on but enough interest to keep me like on the dance floor and that whole DJing thing of like how do you not tire out your listeners how do you like keep them like build up tension, build up tension, have an awesome moment and then go back. And now we're just chilling. Um, and I think like, I, I really appreciate that skill, like enjoying that skill that people have built. Um, mm. So yeah. So any bangers that make me dance at the end of the day, I'm, you know, they're, they're good bangers by me. Mm. What makes you proud of a track that you've created so far or in the future, if you make more music, what would make you proud of a track that you made? 
Mm-hmm. When I first started, the most proud track I had was like one that I played for a couple of my DJ friends and they lost their shit. They were like, Brent, you need to, you need to put this out there. Like this needs to exist. And that, that ruled. Um, mm-hmm. I was trying to create an album back then. And like, that felt really, really good. Um, funny enough, it was not one of my favorite tracks. It was just kind of one that I had created on a side day. I thought it was nice, but they just like lost it. Um, these days I mostly just make music to process emotions and like kind of hang out with myself. Mm. And so there are just some weird tracks that I've made that I'm just inordinate, inordinately proud of. Um, one that I just took all the samples, like I was listening to some Fred again interviews where he was talking about just collecting samples from real life. And I took all the samples from my Thailand trip and just like put them into this like journey of a song where we go through all sorts of stuff. Like I sampled some songs that I, I was listening to a lot back then and it's not a good song like it's the song is not good but man it like it just it captures an essence and mm. and like I can I I know exactly where I was sitting when I made it um and that that feeling of like place um god I love that mm. Mm. yeah it makes me we've talked about this before but um that kind of gives me a sense of what it might be like for Fred again to listen to his own music. And yeah, that's something I wonder about. Like I've, I've said this to you before, but like when I watch him playing, I just get the sense that there's something about what his experience is like. Like I I honestly imagine he might not even be able to describe it. Like, I don't know. Um, but that there's like something happening for him of like what it's like for him to, I mean, this is probably true for all creative people, of course, but there's something specifically about his, also he's Fred, you know? So, (laughs) yeah. So like hearing you talk about that gives me a sense of what that might be like for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like all, all that he shared on, I think it was like the tape notes podcast, um, Mm. just of his process and like, yeah, he knows exactly where he was. He was in Bergheim for a weekend and just heard the techno work and heard the layers on top of it and had the people talking behind him in the cafe that he tossed in like that sense of place like uh yeah he's definitely been an inspiration there um but Mm. yeah uh, it's cool (laughs) how are you finding like you you said earlier that there's this temptation to just go off and do ableton for two months or something like that and obviously you're starting your company and are going to be CEO, but like, is there a balance that you're finding between, um, you know, working on your company and doing things like creating music or other aspects of your life? Mm-hmm. Other aspects, definitely. Um, I'm struggling with the making music because it's on a computer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm done with screens. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh-huh. I, just, I declare, yeah, I declare defeat. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I'll go back. That's definitely a growth edge right now where uh, there's just so much excitement and so much stuff going on that I want to put my energy into with the company. And uh, it certainly seems like creating things is an antidote to that. So, uh, or like an antidote to the uh, the burnout that kind of it follows from being in that state too much. So I bought a, uh, a whittling kit three mm. weeks ago and I've had a lot of fun. Um can show you an entire collection of half finished squirrels and angry old men um i really enjoying uh, my girlfriend and i will put on it's our most like uh boomer coded behavior where we'll put on an audiobook we'll put the audiobook in the middle of the room she will knit and i'll whittle <laughs> and it's, it's man i mean well, sex is great but <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah so trying trying to find some hobbies uh that are maybe more more physically oriented uh, uh, proving nice i've heard rumors that these exist <laughs> <laughs> physical the physical world I, i'll believe it when i see it <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh man oh, well we've covered a huge territory is there anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk more about mm-hmm
yes i'm i'm looking for the right words though mm. like might need to edit out the super long pause maybe, maybe we just keep it in you know either either one i love the pauses no problem you take as long as you need brother awesome <laughs> I guess I'm curious uh, if, for you if there's anyone that you've met recently that you um, have learned exists like via books or or recorded or uh, recorded podcasts, whatever, um, that you're like drawing energy from that, that just them being in the world or their way of being is is really adding to your life. Hmm. 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 There's a few different people coming to mind. I'm just thinking about who I want to talk about. I mean, for starters, I'd just say that a practice that I've developed that I feel is really important to me that I'm always deepening. And it's not like, oh, I'm amazing at this or something, but it's like a way of seeing that I try to hold is um, that everyone I meet has something that I can learn from them. And they're almost a teacher to me. And also that it's possible that I could offer something to each person that I meet, that I can both give and receive. I can receive something. I can learn something. I can give something. I can offer something that would be a benefit. And so like, in fact, this podcast is really a way for me to practice that mm. where it's like, I know I can learn something from this person and let me talk to them for a couple hours and be like, what can I learn from their life and what they have to share? And, and often it's very, um, I don't know. I, I've been watching really closely because I've done several podcasts the last few days. I did one with Anita, who you know, and I did one with Hamish, and then I did one with Sue Burke. And I really enjoy watching my phenomenology as I talk to people, including in this conversation, where it's like, what am I paying attention to? How do I ask questions and that sort of thing? And um, Often the thing, when I look back on the conversations that I've really learned something that's changed my life from, it's not necessarily the thing I, I that they thought we were going to talk about, or like they might not have known that it was an incredibly significant moment for me, but like just the way someone said something or their tone of voice or their facial expression or uh, something that I learned from the way that they talk about things. It, it may not just be the words that that's why I, I make it. A video podcast because I feel like there's so much that's conveyed in people's facial expressions and um, like it's not just the audio and um, so I don't know um, each of those conversations that I've had the last few days for the podcast it's like oh there's something that I learned and that was transmitted for me which I'm still digesting um, I think um Mm. Yeah, I think on the when I think about specifics, a lot of these things feel very nebulous where I'm like pointed in a direction. Oh, I'm inspired to, you know, do this more or try this more or um I reconnect to some aspect of myself of something that I'm curious about. I think um yeah. Oh, may, maybe I'll share this. Yeah, this is a good answer. <laughs> if, if, I, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna say a specific person, I'll say the specific person, um, which is um, uh, in passing a few weeks ago. Paul Millard mentioned this book that he'd read. He he mentioned that his him writing his book came from him doing lots of conversations before writing the Pathless Path, and that he had lots of conversations because he read this book called A Curious Mind. I think is what it's called, and it's by this guy, Brian Grazer, who I didn't know before he mentioned this, but is like a big movie producer or like involved in the movie industry. Mm -hmm. And he's made a helped make a lot of films that I quite like. And um, he has, a, he wrote this book about his practice of 
you know, since he was, I don't know, like 20 or 23 or something, he made a regular practice of having conversations with people that he was curious about. And um, he tried to never go two weeks without having one of these conversations. And um, he eventually he made a rule that it had to be people outside of the film industry, like because he was in the film industry and he wanted to be like really informed by lots of different perspectives. And um, he never knew exactly what he would get out of a conversation or, you know, sometimes he'd be talking to someone really prestigious and then that conversation wouldn't be like yeah. actually change his life or something, but just being open to talking to people and following his curiosity and asking lots of questions. And, you know, I think that was really inspiring for me because in some ways I've already done that with this podcast and I've already talked to a lot of people even outside of the podcast, but just reconnecting to why I'm doing this and what it means for me and how it's a practice and the way that he talked about curiosity. He also had this really good point about how curiosity has become his management style where he like asks questions of people and like, I had been struggling with this of like, what do I do if I disagree with someone or think that their idea maybe isn't going to work or something. And I don't want to be a jerk. The love department part of me is like, I want to be loving and kind and friendly and have people enjoy working with me. And I want to enjoy working with them. But it's like, oh, I can just ask questions. Like, what do you think will happen with this? Or um, how are you thinking about this? And maybe there's something that's happening that I don't know about. That's like, if I hadn't asked about it, I wouldn't really understand where they're coming from or how they're thinking about something. And um, often people's suggestions actually are the right thing. And I just never would have thought of that. And um, yeah, in any case, it really inspired me. Uh, curiosity was something that was so, is so important to me already, obviously, but it, would, it almost felt like finding a peer of, or, or a senior and someone who practiced this for his whole life and was like, here's what this has been like for me and why I care about it. And it was really good to read it right before this I hadn't been able to record the podcast for a few months just because I'm also a pilgrim and, you know, it's hard to schedule. And I had this batch of several podcasts scheduled and it was really good to read that before of like, oh, this is why I care about this. And this is what curiosity means to me and how to approach it. And that's, that's probably the one specific person I'd mentioned, but again, just zooming out, like for me, every interaction is a chance to learn something from someone. Mm -hmm. That's really lovely. Mm. Yeah, that part about asking questions really hit. That was a that was a lesson I I really learned strong last month. Mm. Um, like a couple key relationships of like I just found myself shutting down ideas and shutting down like the energy, and I saw mm. that effect I was having, and that's not what I wanted to have. I just you know, uh, and yeah, <laughs> shifting <laughs> <into> that. <laughs> I also had my opinions, man. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, shifting into that mode of like, okay, just immediate. If there's a disagreement, I'm asking a question. Mm -hmm. and there it is. That's going to result. Yeah, there it is. Or several questions or 10 questions. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. I feel like uh, that works really well. It, it's interesting that we, it seems like we learned this lesson around the same time. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> astrology, what? <laughs> astrology for managers? Where is this? <laughs> So I can't, uh, I can't see any stars from where I am. So yeah. it's fake. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anything else you'd like to talk about? Yeah. Um, you bring a lot of intention like all the time, um, or at least it seems like that from the outside. I won't say all the time, like, uh, because I don't want to put you up on a pedestal. Um, has that always been the case? Um, and if, if not like this, this energy that you bring, like what, 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 what was it like to develop that? Hmm. And maybe it's based stats, Tasha, and like, that was just how you're born and that rules too. Hmm. Hmm. I think on the one hand, I've always been like this. And on the other hand, it's sort of matured. I remember as a kid, something I would do is if I got interested in something, I would go to the library and I would check out like 10 books about that. And maybe I wouldn't read all of them, but like I would look through a lot of them and read as many of them as I could. And um, that was something that I was always 
that I would always do if I was interested in something and that was recurring at all. Um, I was almost confused that other people didn't do that. I was like, oh, if you want to learn about something, why wouldn't you just check out like 10 books about it and like learn something about it? And um, I don't even know how, I mean, I don't know. I believe in reincarnation. So <laughs> I think I came in with that one. And uh, I think it got a lot more serious at through the monastic training. I think that was incredibly powerful for me and uh there was a lot of stuff that i learned there consciously subconsciously about how to approach um your life i remember there was one retreat i think it must have been winter where sorry you gave a talk where he mentioned in passing this idea that your life is a piece of art and you're the artist and you know, your life is the canvas. And I, I forget exactly how he put it. And of course, many people have said this, but he's someone that I really have always looked up to since I've known him. And, you know, it, it, it was an aside in a talk, like it wasn't the main point at all, but that really struck me. And I knew that he was someone who was doing that, that uh, in his own way, his life is a piece of art and he's really living his vow. And, um, I think that stayed with me and uh, I've, you know, of course there've been different answers over the years of what my life is and how I want to live and what projects I want to work on. And this is always changing. And I think that's something you have to wrestle with that things change. But um, if I'm doing something, I want to do it well. And um, I think also a big part of it has become, especially in the last few years, recognizing that for me, fun has to be a part of what I'm doing. Like I'm, I don't want to just grind on something that I think is important for the world or that I'm good at. Even it's like, I want to do stuff that's fun. And I've noticed that when I really let myself do that, if I really prioritize fun as a part of the projects I choose, it's so much more sustainable. And I can even do, I'm, that's part of how I'm so prolific is like, I, you know, I, I write a lot. I do a lot of different projects, a lot of different service projects and I do it because it's fun. There's nobody you'd have to, you literally have to force me not to <laughs> like, it's not like I force my wake up and I'm like, geez, how can I, um, th there's this attitude you could have towards service of like, I need to benefit other people. I need to, this sort of like savior complex you're talking about, which I've, you know, I really related to of like, oh, I need to help people and there's a problem and I need to fix it. I still care a lot about service, obviously. That's a huge value for me as well. But if I had to choose between fun and service, I'd choose fun because um, I want to enjoy my life. And that's part of what making a beautiful life seems to me is like, if I'm not enjoying my own life, then I don't think it's been well lived. And that has to come first and foremost for me. And I think, in fact, if you really do that, it actually, it will be a life that is of service. It's a it's um, that's why I don't like those words because they impose a false dichotomy, I think, but it, real, real fun really is of service in my experience. So um, I think that I don't, there were certain innate things that I had coming into this life. Those were sort of formed at the monastery. And then once I really committed to fun being an important value, which wasn't something that really was emphasized at the monastery um, uh, at Maple, at least in my experience of it. Once I really realized that I was prioritizing that and doubled down on it, that that's led to a lot of this. What you what you're seeing is intention being intentional about my life. Oh, it's beautiful, mm. really beautiful. That uh, yeah, that fun definitely um, shines through. Mm. <laughs> It's like this lovely permission function that I've seen you have on people of like, yeah, you know, you can just have fun with it, right? I'm like, oh, I can have fun with it. I can have fun with it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe a last, a last question or a next question. We'll see which one it ends up being of the two. Um, is there anything that surprised you in your practice recently? And I'll let you choose what the word practice means. Well, I just recently wrote an essay that maybe you've read um, called Tashin Can Meditate as a Treat. It's a newsletter essay. And um, 
to zoom out a little bit, I think I've kind of found my own way into what you might call inquiry, where at certain points, Sodi was trying to help me do inquiry and having me ask questions. And that was all well and good and, you know, maybe made progress on some of those questions. But eventually I kind of had to find my own way into it. And um, usually my experience of it subjectively is something like, at a certain point, I realize that I'm asking a question and it's often like pretty late in the process and that a lot of my behaviors over recent months or years have been in service of a question that really often I can only articulate what the question was after I've answered it and come to the answer. And this essay was about a question that I realized I'd been holding for years of I mean, I phrase it a few different ways in the essay, but something like, why am I not enjoying meditating anymore? Why don't I like meditating? Why is this not fun? Um, what is even what even is meditation? How should I approach it? I think that I'd held this very specific frame of what meditation was and how I should practice it that really did serve me in my late teens and my 20s. Mm. Um, and the monastic structure was really good for that. But it was sort of coercive and I had to, I was like, it was like dirty fuel and I was making a trade off of, um, you know, on several things for meditating more, making more progress. And I, I did make progress. That was good. But eventually it just stopped working. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I had to find a new way to hold, even hold what practice is and how to do it. And the answers I've come to kind of surprised me because Maybe some of the individual things are things that I'd heard elsewhere, but not all of them at once. And I hadn't heard them from a teacher. And um, just even writing that essay was such an important milestone because I really articulated to myself how I saw practice and what practice was and gave myself permission to see it from a new lens. Like in the old lens, that I had. It's like, I'm not doing daily practice. I don't do formal sitting every day. I'm not sitting still if I do practice. Like, and he, I can almost hear him saying like, what are you doing? Like awakening is the most important thing. You're wasting your life. Like that's the purpose of life is to get enlightened and you're not meditating every day and you're not sitting still and you're not enlightened according to my definition of what enlightenment is. Like you're fucking up. Like what's, and he would be really upset about that. Like at a certain point in my life, like my past self would be so upset. And in this new way, it's like, um, one of the central words has been recharging. And it's like, hey, I'm this battery of wisdom and love and care for the world. And I want to use as much of that energy and love as I can. And to do that sustainably over my life, I need to charge the battery and recharge it and tend to that. And what actually in the moment recharges me probably isn't going to be sitting still for two hours at a certain time every day doing a specific, like, that's not really recharging for me, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like, hey, after, like, actually, before this podcast, I took some time to do different things that were recharging for me. And like, I laid down, I listened to music, I listened to EDM, and like, did practices that I knew how to do. And then I was doing some motion practice. And like, that was what my body mind wanted at that time at a specific moment in time, it wanted something specific. And so it's much more variable. It's like when I do it, how I do it, what it looks like. There's a lot of different practices and techniques that I've been exposed to and just giving myself permission. Hey, you can do any of these whenever you want, if it's recharging, if that's what you want. And then when I really do that, it feels good. Like my body feels great right now during this podcast. Like I can pay attention to you and enjoy our conversation instead of being, I was kind of like stressed earlier in the day. And you know, thinking about different things and having different emotions come up. I was like angry last night about something, something stupid, <laughs> a customer service thing I needed help with made me that for some reason made me angry. It's like, oh, I need to like tend to my heart and tend to my body to be able to show up to something like this. And um, it feels good to feel good in my body. And, and as opposed to if I just went in of like, okay, I need to wake up at six or seven in the morning and meditate for half an hour or an hour or two hours and sit still on a cushion like, that's just not what it looks like anymore. It's like between things, when I need it, as I feel like it, as called, I can do any of the practices that I've been exposed to in any position for any length of time, including one second, like that's recharging, <laughs> you know? 
Like it doesn't need to be some specific container and um, taking the time to articulate everything that I have learned about this. And I mean, I wrote that essay, I made this piece of art to kind of symbolize it. And I actually did this thing where I like reread a bunch of my journal entries from the last few years about this topic and like wrote a separate post that was just compiling those journal entries of like me asking this question over and over again in different ways. Like I feel so much relief where that younger version of myself isn't upset anymore. And he's like, oh, I see what you're doing and that this is a good thing. And like, that's a cool way to practice too. And that does seem to be really working for you instead of the thing that I thought. And um, that's really freeing and makes actually makes me excited about practice again, where like, I want to be learning more about different styles of practice and trying different things as opposed to the thing before just was not, was not working. So that's, that has surprised me. <laughs> that absolutely rules. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen in our community kind of wrestle with the question of like coercion versus non-coercion. And yeah, for me, like it very much falls in um, like devotion of just devotion as the frame, frame that works for me. Mm -hmm. um, What's that like for you? to be devoted yeah i it's it's a hard one to answer because the word devotion um just saying it feels like a prayer mm. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah it bring it brings me somewhere uh just to just to say that um yeah mm. <laughs> yeah um it uh it's a loving thing it's not it's not a question of like am i doing this or or am i not doing it it's a, it's a quality of doing um i just like it <laughs> yeah i just really like it. it it feels it feels freeing and an energy giving but a growth edge like that kind of way i don't think i found my version of of the fun or do it for a treat or recharge like i i do low energy is a problem i've i've dealt with for quite a while and it used to be periods of depressions now that's pretty rare um but just having the energy and intention to do something is has been difficult but if i if i link it to this this larger frame that at least like gives me some some scaffolding where it's not about forcing it it creates some gradient where something can go like slope downhill the water can run downhill you don't have to push it and mop it um yeah what is it that you're devoted to when you experience that like can you say can you say more yeah Yeah, I I see the faces of people that I love. <laughs> I see um I don't want to call it like generic bodhisattva imagery, but like, you know, the phrase like, you know, a multitude of beings or countless beings of how to free them. Um just this picture of that um comes up and yeah, uh, like Verbea has this talk uh, of, of on devotion, and that was something that just really touched me last year. Um, of like, be devoted. Be, I think the 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 Rumi quote that he included was, uh, "Be a love dog that howls um, late into the night." Mm. Um, and yeah, there's there's this like beyondness that it kind of. Uh, it implies and it feels like a just this expansion that happens um yeah, it's mm. <laughs> it's good i'm I'm thankful for this opportunity because uh just saying all this out loud i can feel it <laughs> and, mm. uh, that's it's a good it, it feels like coming home i guess you know my when i was when i was six um i made a a book of poetry with my grandma i would point at a at a, at a cloud and she would take a picture of the cloud and I'd very quickly take the back of the pic, you know, uh, back of a, a notebook that we carried everywhere and write a poem about how fluffy it was or how big it was. And uh, yeah, so yeah, there's this like 
I don't know, devotion as coming home to like, just, yeah, we're, we're, we, we've seen the cloud, we've seen this beautiful thing and we're devoted to its beauty. And we're just going to allow that, allow that to drive for a little bit. Hmm. In this moment, hearing you talk about that, and as we close this conversation, I feel a lot of love for you in my heart. And, um, you know, there's so many different areas of your life that we've talked about. And there's this like yearning for you to just flourish as a whole person. Like, I really want Refract to succeed and see where that goes and where that leads you. And I want to see you grow as a leader. And I also want this creative side of you that makes music or whittles or, you know, does other things to like flourish and have a way to express itself. And above all, I want your heart to be happy and for you to feel love and have friendships in your life and just to succeed as a whole person, not just as a leader or your company, which I of course want as well, but just like, I, uh, I hope Brent has a beautiful life is how my heart feels right now. session like receiving that um yeah you're uh you're a very important person in my life and i'm so thankful that you're there i'm so thankful for what you do for yeah <laughs> uh that like yeah treating the full human like being here for the full human i i feel very seen and uh supported so it it means so much and uh it's kind of rolled to have a two and a half hour conversation I like, <laughs> you know, I love them. Just do this. <laughs> I love them so much. Thank you for joining me for one. It's been a real pleasure, pleasure and privilege, my friend. Thanks, Nashan.